Welcome back, session four of our nine-week study on the book of Revelation. Last week, uh, via Skype, we talked about the historical background of the book of Revelation. And I said if I was going to summarize the entire book of Revelation in its historical context, because context is important, as we saw in the first two weeks, that I would use the word conflict. That the churches of Asia Minor were in a time of conflict. And we define conflict as where two people or two groups try to occupy the exact same space at the exact same time. Conflict occurs. Conflict happens. And conflict is what these churches were experiencing. Today, though, I want to shift a little bit of a gear, or shift our gears just a little bit. We're still talking about the context book of Revelation, but we're going to be talking about more literary context, literature itself. We're actually going, uh, well, let's start off by, let me ask you this question. Um, how do we know what questions to ask of a text? That's an important question to ask, because the bottom line is, if you ask the wrong questions, you'll get answers. I mean, we're pretty in, in innovative in the ways in which we find answers to our questions in a text, even if it's not even the right question to ask a text. If we ask the wrong questions, we will get answers. But the question I want us to start off with is, how do we know what questions to even ask? The answer to that question is also summarized in one word. Genre. Now, I know on paper it looks like genre, but it's not how it's pronounced. It's pronounced Genre. It's a French word, so you can feel, I don't know, I guess more sophisticated. Or, um, or maybe it makes your stomach churn that it's from the French. But a lot of our language is from the French. doesn't matter. Let's keep moving. Genre is a French word that, is, that means kind or type. Um, and if I was expanding the definition a bit, even, even category. So when we talk about the genre of a writing, then what we are talking about is the type or the kind of the document. What is it? Or how can it be categorized? Now, some people may be saying, okay, who really cares about genre? Well, let me give you an example. We're going to put a headline uh, on the PowerPoint, and the headline is going to be pretty simple. The headline reads this, Tigers Massacre Indians. Tigers Massacre Indians. How do we define what it is that that title means? I mean, what does that headline mean? indicate. And if you had to interpret that, what are the different things that would go through your mind regarding how you would read this headline? I'll give you a minute to think about it. Now, it, really, the answer to my question has a lot to do with what section of the newspaper you're actually in. I mean, if you are in the international section, then the idea of Tigers Massacre Indians is a headline that describes a story of people native to the country of India have been massacred by animals known as tigers. It's about killings of people. And if that is the case, then some questions would come into my mind. Questions like, are any of my missionary friends there? I have a lot of missionary friends in India. And if I see a title like this in the international section of the newspaper, my mind goes to them. Or I might even be asking, how many people? How many people were killed? The problem is that there isn't just one way to read that headline, Tigers Massacre Indians. Because what if you're in the local section of the newspaper? And now you see it's a very politically incorrect way of talking about tigers who maybe got loose from a zoo and killed some Native Americans. That's what the headline could indicate if you're in the local section. But now that you're in the local section, your questions would change. I'm not necessarily asking you know, were my missionary friends in India killed? Now I'm asking the question, are the tigers still loose? Because if it's in the local section, I could be threatened. Do you see the issue? But there is another way to interpret this headline. And all the jocks in the audience right now probably was the first thing that came to their mind. They may look at it and say, oh, well, the Detroit Tigers must have absolutely destroyed the Cleveland Indians in their baseball game. Well, that's exactly how the title should be read if you're in the sports section. So you may be asking questions then like, what was the score? Are there playoff implications? Your questions will follow the section of the newspaper or the genre that you're in. What becomes really awkward is if you start using questions from one genre and laying it over the top 
of the other one. I mean, like if, if I'm in the international section and I, and I see Tigers Massacre Indians, I would not ask the question, what was the score? I, I mean, I, I would not ask the question, I wonder if there's playoff implications. No, the question makes no sense. The question actually, even though it is a question, and frankly it's the wrong question, you could probably still find an answer in the international sections to your question. The genre would say that's the wrong question to ask anyway. One of the key questions that we need to ask about the book of Revelation is, what are the genres? But I know what some of you are thinking. You're thinking, before I even ask, what are the genres of Revelation? Some of you may be wondering, how in the world do I even learn about genres? I mean, I can barely say the word, more or less actually dictate what it is that the genre itself is asking me to ask. Well, here's the wonderful thing about genres. You are an expert on genres already, and you don't even know it. I mean, the, the bottom line is, we are constantly thinking through and functioning in a world saturated with genres. I mean, think about it. Whenever you go, uh, let's just say you get home from work, and one of the first things you do is you go to your mailbox and you grab out the mail and one of the letters that, that you get, one of the envelopes says 0% in big bold. I mean, well, what is it? Yeah, it's some sort of, you know, credit card offer or maybe a refinance or something along those lines. How do you know? Because the envelope itself puts it in a genre. If it is handwritten and it has an address in a location that you are familiar with, you will interact with that envelope different than you will with the one that says 0%. You function with genres every day. Or let me give you another example. Um, for some reason, you know, the, 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 I think it's a part of the fall, but you, you like country music. Um, and you know, I'm sorry, I, know, I probably just made some enemies there and I you know, kind of apologize, but I mean, it's country music. I mean, and anyway. Uh, you get a new album, you download it on iTunes, and you start listening to it, and immediately you hear, very first chord, is this screaming electric guitar and a guy just yelling at the top of his lungs. Would you say, huh, I got the right album? Or would you think there was an error, a mistake? Of course you would, because country music must have twang, and some dog may have died. Or, there is genre things that must fit for country music to be what it is. Or, or, or even um, whenever you're flipping through the TV, you know, you have your a bajillion channels on satellite, but what you're really wanting to find is the news for the day. And you land on TLC. Do you think you're going to find what you're looking for? Or you land, you're looking for the news of the day of what's happened around the world, and you land on ESPN. Will you find what you're looking for? What's interesting is, is all I am doing is even saying a random uh, order of letters. And yet you know intuitively that you would not go to TLC to find your news, your world news. You would not even go to ESPN, unless your world news is limited to only sports. No, you would go to stations like, like CNN. Again, I'm just listing letters. But the coordination of those letters actually point to a genre that lets you know what questions to ask the channel that you are at. It is not fair to get frustrated at TLC because you don't know what happened in the news of the world. That's not what those letters are intended to do. Is this making sense? You're actually an expert on genre already and you don't even know it. You use it every single day. So now what I want us to do is to take our orientation of genres and to actually import it into our study of the book of Revelation. I mean, if you were trying to, let's just say you don't have a GPS and you needed to get a map and you go to a bookstore, you would not look in you know, the front of J.R.L. Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings to use that map to get from your location to, let's say, Florida. No, because it was a violation of genres. You would end up in Middle Earth, and I don't even know how you would do that. The whole point is, genres help us confine our questions. So looking at the genres of Revelation will help us understand what questions make sense and what questions are like asking the international section of the newspaper, what was the score? Is this making sense? Well, let's dive in, regardless if it is or isn't. Because I'm not there to have your questions being asked. <laughs> See how that virtually it's good and weird all at the same time. The first genre of the book of Revelation is the epistolary genre. Fancy word for saying it's a letter. It's a letter. Revelation chapter 1, verses 4 through 5, 
immediately tells us this is a letter. Why? Because it says, John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits before his throne and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. If you're in the ancient world, what you just heard was, Dear John, that's what you heard. Why? Because in the ancient world, like our letters today, they followed a particular, a particular um, set of elements. The very first letter of an epistle, or the very first element in an ancient epistle was you would identify who is sending the letter, which personally I find that it makes way more sense than the way we do it. I mean, I don't know if you've ever received a handwritten letter. At the very beginning, it says, you know, dear your name, so dear Shane. But then if you're like, I don't even know who this is from, you have to flip through 10 pages because they got carried away to find their signature at the end. It would be so much more helpful if we actually put our name, the person that's writing at the front, like they did in the ancient world. But I'm not here to change our epistolary genres. I'm just here to describe the ancient worlds. So they would put the identity of the sender at the front. And the very next thing they would put is, who are they sending it to? So in Revelation, we have John is writing to the seven churches in the province of Asia, which is a pretty important principle. We talked about this in historical background. We even talked about it on some level the very first lecture. But if any of our interpretations would have seemed completely foreign, if not absolutely incomprehensible, to the people who's originally written to, we should question whether or not we are asking the right questions. It is written by John to the seven churches in the province of Asia, Asia Minor. And then the third element in especially Christian epistles uh, is a salutation of some sort. Normally, the New Testament texts have uh, grace and peace to you. As a matter of fact, out of the 20 of our New Testament epistles that actually have a salutation, there are two that have no salutation, they just jump right in, Hebrews and 1 John. But out of the 20 that do, 18 of them say grace and peace. Grace and peace to you. So whenever I read John to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is, I know right away what genre we're in. We're in a letter. But if you don't believe me or if you're still not convinced, turn to Revelation chapter 22 verse 21. It says, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. Amen. And if you're in a Christian epistle, what you heard was, sincerely, John. You know what genre you're in because of the way in which he has written the text, because of the key indicators that we can find right in the text. We cannot forget this is written to a real people at a real time going through real struggles. We talked about this last lecture, but I want to actually point it out. In your handout, you have a map. Your map should look something along these lines. You have a map. And if you look in the lower left-hand side, you see Patmos. Revelation chapter 1, verse 9, I, John, was on the island of Patmos. That's where he's at, the island in the lower left-hand corner. Now, if you look in the middle of the map, you'll see a dotted line that's connecting several cities. If John is going to send a letter from Patmos to seven cities of Asia Minor, he wouldn't actually send it to Miletus, even though that is the closest city. Why? Because that dotted line is a Roman road, a trade route, that also is used as a mail route. John would send the letter from Patmos to the first city that is on the mail route, which is the city of Ephesus. Now, if you look in Revelation chapter 2, verse 1, what you will find is the very first city that John writes this book to is the city of Ephesus. Now look at the map. If you move up, if you move north on the the dotted line from Ephesus, the next city you hit is Smyrna. And if you look in Revelation chapter 2, verse 8, the second city that the letter is addressed to is Smyrna. If you go to the map, the third city is Pergamum. Third city in Revelation 2, Pergamum. Fourth city on the map, Thyatira. Fourth city in Revelation 2, Thyatira. And then Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea. The book of Revelation is written to seven real cities at a real place in a real time going through real struggles. And their minister, their pastor John, has written them a letter to encourage them in the midst of their conflict. 
This is what the epistolary genre points us to. This section of the newspaper then comes with specific questions because of specific situations that are happening. I mentioned this uh, the last lecture, uh, no, excuse me, two lectures ago. I mentioned this when we were talking about semantic bombs. But it's, it's, it's important to repeat it again. Every New Testament book was written as an occasional document. Something happened, and it caused them to put their pen to the paper. It's not like Paul sat down and was like, I'm going to write Romans, and it's going to dazzle generations from here on out. No, there's a situation going on in the city of Rome that Paul had not visited yet, but he longed to. And he's writing to the Christians and Romans to deal with the situation that, frankly, has happened because they have bad theology. He's asking, how in the world can there be divisions, especially amongst Jew and Gentiles? Do you not know who Jesus is? Same thing is true of Revelation. It's not like John sat down and was like, I'm going to give them the most amazing prediction they've ever seen, as if prophecy was even equal to prediction alone. No, these people are experiencing real things. And their minister, John, writes them a letter. He writes them an epistle to minister to their needs so that after they read it, they would be overwhelmed both with the revelation of who God is, what He desires, and what now is demanding from His people. So, whenever you come to the epistolary genre, there are certain questions that should be going through your mind. Questions like, who is writing the book? Who is writing the book? And even, what is the situation that the person that's writing, what situation are they in? John is exiled to the island of Patmos because of the testimony of Jesus Christ. Because he has preached the word, he has been banished to the mines of Patmos. Although it's debated whether or not there's mines, but it's a whole other issue. You also need to ask questions like, why is the person writing to this audience? Who is the audience he is writing to? What are they experiencing? And how does this book apply to their situation? These are the questions that fit the section of the newspaper. Whenever you're in epistolary genre, you will ask questions like this. Is this making sense? One of the things where it makes it a little more complicated is that you don't always only have one genre. You know, we experience this in music all the time. It's kind of the big debate of, is Taylor Swift country enough? Why? Because she's, she's actually blurring genres. I mean, for a while there, we had, you know, rap artists uh, singing with country music artists in the same song. It's like, I don't really know if this is rap or country or something in between. Whenever you're committing to a genre, it doesn't mean that you cannot also engage other genres. So, for example, uh, we have in the book of Revelation not just an epistolary genre, but also a prophetic genre. How do we know this? Read Revelation chapter 1, verse 3. It says, Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. As a matter of fact, this is the first time out of four times that the book of Revelation will be called a prophecy in the text. Revelation 1, 3, it's called a prophecy. Jesus calls it a prophecy in Revelation 22, verse 7. Then you have an angel who describes the contents of Revelation as a prophecy in 22, verse 10. And then you have John himself once again repeating in 22, verse 18, what he says here in 1, 3. That what you have in the book of Revelation is a prophecy. Now, we need to remember what it is we talked about two weeks ago. Prophecy does not equal prediction. Prophecy is a revelation of three things. Who God is, what God desires, and what God demands of His people. Who God is, what God desires, and what God demands from His people. And if you remember, we also said that you, you receive a prophecy whenever you are a people in rebellion. A prophecy is written to persuade and to prosecute a people in rebellion. A, prosecute, or I mean, a prophecy is demanding a response from the audience. Why is this important? Well, it's because what we have commanded in Revelation chapter 1, verse 3, in connection with the word prophecy. It says, Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. Let me stop right there. Reads aloud. These letters would have been verbal proclamation. As a matter of fact, you should envision every book of the New Testament, even the Gospels, as things that were read out loud in congregations. Why? 
Well, number one, not everybody was able to have a Bible in their hands. It was very expensive to produce a scroll, especially the size of a, of a book of Luke or uh, the, two, you know, the fact that it was two volumes, so Luke Acts. That type of a scroll would have been very long and very expensive, something that most people in the ancient world would not have been able to afford. And then also, most people in the ancient world didn't know how to read. So they are given to their, they've given their lives to Christ. They've accepted His grace, but they don't have the money to buy their own document. And they don't even, if, if they bought it, they wouldn't even be able to read it. So what happens is they would get together in these congregational meetings, sometimes covert because of persecution, sometimes not. And one person would be declared the reader. The person that would stand up and read aloud the document. As a matter of fact, the book of Revelation is most powerfully experienced whenever you are sitting and listening to it being read over you. Which is exactly the way in which they would have been experiencing an explosion of images in the mind. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. Now listen to this. Blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it. Okay. For the life of me, I have no idea why the NIV chose to translate that Greek word, take to heart. Uh, frankly, I don't even know what that means. Like, what does it mean to take something to heart? You know, I tell something to you, and I'm like, hey, take this to heart. You're like, I mean, uh, okay. I mean, what is the action that's being commanded of you there? No, I mean, actually, that word in the Greek literally means heed or obey. Blessed are those who hear the word and then obey what is written in it. Remember what a prophecy is. It's not a prediction. We mentioned before how absurd it is to think that you can obey a prediction. There's going to be an earthquake in California in three weeks. Obey this prediction. No, a prediction a lot of times is passive. You are passive. Something happens to you. It's not something that you obey and do. You don't obey a prediction. You obey a prophecy. For whenever God reveals who He is, and He reveals what He desires, where this story is headed, and then He looks at you and reveals what He demands from His people, then you very clearly have the opportunity not to just take it to heart in some weird spiritual sense, but in the very concrete sense, you have an opportunity to obey what God is asking from you. In the concept of prophecy, in the book of Revelation, Revelation is getting into the faces of those in Asia Minor that are in conflict and it is saying, there is something required of you. There is something that I'm demanding from you. We'll talk about this in a couple of weeks. But too often our Christianity is passive. We receive Christ, we sit in the pews, and we're good. When you read the book of Revelation, you realize that is not an option. You were not saved so that you can be lazy. You were saved so that you can get out there and do work. That's why you were saved. But we'll talk about that later. Just put it in your back pocket for now. Revelation is speaking to a group of people that are caught in conflict with the Roman Empire. And when they are, they are having multiple options. They can acquiesce to the Roman Empire. They can submit to the Roman Empire. They can curse Christ and follow Rome, which some of them have done. Or they can stand firm. And in the churches of Asia Minor, some are choosing the wrong choice. And as a result, God commissions John to write a prophecy to a rebellious people demanding that they stand firm or demanding they repent. Depends on which camp they're in. If this is the case, if this is the genre, then our questions will naturally follow it. We will ask questions like, what is this prophecy revealing about who God is? I mean, what is this prophecy revealing about what God desires. What is this prophecy revealing about what God demands from us? These are the questions that match the section of the newspaper. Notice one of the things I did not say. I did not say, what does this prophecy predict about when it's going to happen? That question is like asking, what is the score? Or are there playoff implications? The question doesn't match the section. The genres help us understand what questions are the right questions to ask. Because remember, if you ask the wrong questions, you can get an answer. But the question is, are you asking the right questions?
So, so far, we've seen that the book of Revelation is the epistolary genre. It is a letter written by a person to a group of people in a situation. It is also prophetic, which clarifies the situation somewhat for us. It's a situation of potential compromise. It's a situation of conflict. It's a situation in which we have some rebellious people. Now comes the third genre, and this one starts off with a $25 word. This is the apocalyptic genre. Sorry, that's the name of it. I wish there was a simpler one, there just isn't. So we probably just need to learn that word. Apocalyptic. You don't have to say it out loud, just say it to yourself a couple of times, just so that you kind of feel like you know what it means. Apocalyptic. Apocalyptic, apocalyptic. See what I mean? Okay, good. Apocalyptic literature. If it has a $25 word, probably should give it a $25 definition. Now, I'm going to read this definition, and then I'm going to go part by part and dissect it so that we're all on the same page. Okay? So let me go ahead and read it. Apocalyptic literature, the apocalyptic genre, is a revelation of transcendent realities, often communicated by otherworldly beings, with a great amount of symbolic language to comfort and exhort an oppressed people. Whew, I told you. <laughs> Big definition, let's break it down. Apocalyptic literature, literature is a revelation of transcendent realities. It is an unveiling of things beyond what our eyes can see. Apocalyptic literature is moving us to a divine perspective to see the things that are happening on earth through God's eyes. It is a revelation of realities that are beyond what we can see, of transcendent realities, of divine realities. It is an unveiling of God's perspective. It is a revelation of transcendent realities that's often communicated by otherworldly beings. You see this all through the book of Revelation. Angels are the ones that are giving, showing John these visions, taking him from heaven to earth. You have one of the 24 elders that comes and speaks to John. Otherworldly beings are usually the ones that are navigating the particular person, in this case John, through these transcendent realities that are saturated with a great amount of symbolic language. Why? You're talking about things that are simply beyond what words can contain. Whenever you start to move towards, and we're going to talk about this more in the uh, lecture on symbols, but whenever you are engaging something, um, a reality, that is, a lot of times it's what means most to you, like love, it's hard to, to put it into words that are free from symbols. What symbols do is it allows our language to be stretched to its breaking point. It allows our language to move beyond what mere language can, can, can accomplish. I mean, in many ways, language is one of the most amazing and sophisticated gifts that we've ever given. And yet, if you're encountering God face to face, you will realize our language is incredibly futile. It is communicated. These otherworldly beings are communicating transcendent realities with a great amount of symbolic language. Why? To comfort those that are in conflict and to exhort those that are in conflict. So let's string it all together. Apocalyptic literature is the unveiling of the divine perspective or a revelation of transcendent realities often communicated by angels or elders or otherworldly beings with a great amount of symbolic language, symbolism, so that language can be stretched to its breaking point in order to comfort and exhort the people that are caught in conflict. That is apocalyptic literature. I told you, a big definition. Now here is an important revelation or important something for you to know. Normally what I'm about to say shocks people. But it's important for us to know because it will help us interpret what is happening in Revelation. Revelation is not the only book written in apocalyptic literature. There are other ones. We have books like First Enoch that was written around the time 1st century BC, 1st century AD. It's written around the time of Revelation. You have 4th Ezra, which was definitely written probably within 15 years of Revelation either side. You have the Assumption of Moses. You have the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 7. Not only does it shift from the first six chapters, uh, because the first six chapters are in Hebrew, and then it switches to Aramaic. But chapter 7 also shifts genre. First six chapters of Daniel in the Old Testament are narrative. You know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and the fiery furnace, and things of that. You know, Daniel in the lion's den, Daniel 6. Narratives. We're comfortable with stories. 
Then Daniel 7 comes, and all of a sudden we have beasts coming out of the sea, and we have this little horn, and it's talking, and it's doing stuff. It shifts to the apocalyptic genre. Revelation's not the only apocalyptic book, and that's helpful, because we can start to see some parallels in the genre to sharpen our questions. Uh, matter of fact, in your handout, I even gave you uh, 2 Esdras, chapter 11, verses 1 through 6. 2 Esdras, uh, well, actually, 4th Ezra is a portion of 2nd Esdras. They're related. Uh, you can look that up. You can Google it, and you'll see the relationship between them. But 2nd Esdras, chapter 11, verses 1 through 6. Now, if you've read Revelation 13, you're going to be, it's going to be startling, because this is going to sound super familiar. This is what it says, though. On the second night, I, I had a dream... And behold, there came up from the sea an eagle that, that had twelve feathered wings and three heads. Okay, let's stop right there and break some of this stuff down. In the book of Daniel, chapter 7, whenever beasts came from the sea, Daniel had it interpreted for him that each of those beasts was a kingdom, an empire. Babylon, Medo-Persia, the Greek empire, the Roman empire. He's, these are empires. So if you're reading around you know, late 90s AD, around the time that John himself is writing Revelation, and you see a beast from the sea that's coming out and it is an eagle, what do you think it's standing for? What kingdom? Rome! I mean, Rome's key symbol was an eagle. <laughs> Keep reading. It says, And there came up from the sea an eagle that had twelve feathered wings and three heads. And I looked, and behold, he, he spread his wings over all the earth, and all the winds of heaven blew upon him, and the clouds were gathered about him. And I looked, and out of his wings there, there grew opposing wings, but they became little, puny wings. But his heads were at rest. The middle head was larger than all the other heads, but it was also at rest with them. And I looked, and behold, the eagle flew with his wings to reign over the earth and over those who dwell in it. And I saw how all things under heaven were subjected to him, and no one spoke against him, not even one creature that was on the earth. What's really fascinating is, notice there's 12 heads. At the time that 2 Ezra was written, at the time Revelation was being written, they were in their 12th emperor. Starting with Julius Caesar and then going to Augustus, and then Tiberius, and then Caligula, and then, and then Nero, and, and Claudius in between there, and then Galba, Otho, and Vitellius, and then Vespasian, Titus, then Domitian, number 12. And there are 12 heads on this eagle. As a matter of fact, it talks about one of them that is larger than the other ones. Why? Because it reigned a longer time. Hence Augustus, who reigns around 40-some-odd years, almost double than everybody else that reigns. It's describing through apocalyptic language, through symbols, what is happening right before them from a divine perspective. Does this make sense? This is a genre that existed that goes all the way back to the time of Daniel. A genre that they would have been just as familiar to them as science fiction is to us. A genre, though, that is being used to communicate realities beyond what they can see to a people caught in conflict to either exhort them or to comfort them. And Revelation is apocalyptic. How do we know? Well, Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, the very first word in the book of Revelation is apocalypsis, from which we get the word apocalyptic. The very genre itself is named after the first word of Revelation. Revelation is actually comes from the, the Latin word uh, that translates apocalypsis, the Greek word. So the very first word says the genre is named after this, so it's probably in that genre. But then, if you keep reading Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, you start to see some of the definition take form. This is an apocalypsis of uh, Jesus Christ. Uh, NIV 2011 made it to the word from, uh, which I don't like, uh, for reasons we can talk about later. But the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place, he made it known by sending his otherworldly beings, angels, to his servant John. Now, I emphasized made it known for a specific reason. It is the exact same Greek word that we will see in Revelation chapter 12, verse 1, when it says, And I looked and saw a sign in heaven. As a matter of fact, the King James Version nails it in Revelation 1, verse 1. King James Version says he signified it by sending his angel. Signified means to make known through signs and symbols. That's what that word means there. So Revelation chapter 1 verse 1, you're seeing all the key elements of the definition itself. 
This is a revelation of transcendent realities, a revelation of Jesus Christ that God gives from His perspective. Through otherworldly beings, He shows to His servants by sending His angels that is usually saturated in symbolic language, or He signified it and made it known by giving it to John. Is this making sense? And then throughout the rest of the book of Revelation, we see it saturated with symbolic language. As a matter of fact, there are several times whenever, if you're going through it, you might miss the symbol, but John yells at you and says, Hey, I'm using a symbol. Don't miss it. Revelation chapter 1, verse 20 says, The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand, Jesus is speaking here, and of the seven gold lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. What did Jesus just do for us there? He interpreted the symbols. He says, in case you missed it, I was holding these, you know, seven stars in my hands. Well, that's actually the angels of the churches. And if you look in chapters 2 and 3, every one of the churches that are written to, it starts off with, to the angel of the church in Smyrna, to the angel of the church in Pergamum. He says, seven stars, that is actually a symbol for the seven angels. And he also says, in the seven lampstands that you saw, that's actually the seven churches. The thing that makes this symbol so beautiful, though, is the fact that in Revelation 1, the Son of Man, the one like a Son of Man, is walking amongst the lampstands. And if you understand that the lampstands is a symbol of the churches, then you can very really apply it to us today and say, even right now as I speak to you through a video, Jesus is walking among you. He is there, very present amongst His people at all times. And the way in which we come to that transcendent reality is through the symbol of the lampstand that John was so specific he didn't want us to miss, that Jesus was so specific he didn't want, to miss, want us to miss it, that he actually interprets it for us. John does this again later, Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. The whole first part of Revelation 12, which we will uh, exegete later, we'll look at later, is this war, and you have this dragon, and at this point, nine verses in, the dragon is introduced in verse 3, and at this point, you don't really know who the dragon is. And then in verse 9 it says, the great dragon was hurled down. That is, the ancient serpent, called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. What did John just do for you there? He says, in case you didn't know who the dragon is at this point, let me tell you very clearly, it is the ancient serpent, remember Genesis 3. We call him the devil. We call him Satan, the accuser. He is the one that leads the whole world astray. Don't miss the symbol. Is this making sense? Does it again in Revelation chapter 19, verse 8. Here we have the wedding feast of the Lamb. Here we have all the people congregating and they are crying out like loud peals of thunder shouting in verse 6. Hallelujah, for the Lord our God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give Him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come and His bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Now, in my Bible, there are parentheses. It says, fine linen stands for the righteous acts of the holy people. Right? Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of the saints. Fine linen is a symbol for the actions of the people. Throughout the book of Revelation, it is constantly telling us, listen, we are speaking in symbols. Why? Because how do you describe what God looks like in Revelation 4 without using symbols? How in the world do you describe what heaven looks like in Revelation 21 and 22 without symbols? How in the world do we describe the transcendent realities that can make all of this world make sense without using symbols? If you know you're in apocalyptic literature, then you know even what questions to ask of the images. For the apocalyptic literature asks us to ask, or tells us to ask questions like this. What does this symbol even point to? Is it a principle? Is it a reality? Or where are these symbols used? Let's maybe say in the Old Testament, which we will talk about here soon in one of the following lectures. Or how would these symbols have affected the original audience? You know what questions to ask because you know what section of the newspaper you are in. So, let's summarize. Revelation is a Christian, prophetic, apocalyptic letter written by a real person to real people to call them to repentance and to respond by giving them a glimpse into the transcendent realities from God's divine perspective of what is happening around them to both comfort and exhort them. And we'll talk about more how that happens next class. Love you guys. See you then.